Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we explore forward-thinking solutions to some of the nation's most urgent crises. We examine how cities across the country are suing opioid manufacturers to recoup the costs of the epidemic. And we sit down with Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian to learn how he's supporting talented young people fighting climate change. But first, we begin in a little-known spot in Texas called Disaster City, where rescue teams learn how to respond to emergencies at a unique 52-acre facility. Janet Chamlian takes us inside to see how realistic scenarios help them prepare for real-world catastrophes. It's devastation in every direction. Train derailments, earthquakes, and other simulated emergencies, all within 52 acres. This is Disaster City, where elite rescue teams learn to save lives. Is there anything else like this? There's no replication of this kind of thing. There's smaller sites that have little bits of this, but nothing to my knowledge, United States or even the world, has this much disaster on this kind of scale. Stephen Bajoon is the training manager for Texas Task Force One, and this is their training ground. A team one of 28 search and rescue squads under FEMA. There are more than a dozen disaster scenarios here, each one based on a real life catastrophe. This is a flattened parking garage modeled on the one underneath the World Trade Center. From 9-11 to Hurricane Katrina and the Surfside building collapse, they've been on the front line of the nation's biggest disaster. What situation might this occur in? So this situation would be for a uh, building collapse, so the guys come in and build these doors to help make the structure safe. Kevin Matheson is a rescue specialist. These scenarios basically train us for any disaster that could happen in, in the world. Did we get a measurement off the wall? The responders execute technical rescues requiring planning and engineering skills. Just tell us if you can start hurting or if you get hung up on something. Even using volunteer victims. Why do the teams need to keep coming back? It's a perishable skill. The things that we learn here, they're so technical and so specific. If you're not constantly swinging that hammer or using that saw, it perishes and you're not ready to be able to do it again when you need it. Keep it as straight as you can. Where training meets tragedy, prepping for the unpredictable. From emergency responders to the men and women in blue, the NYPD is on a mission to convert its massive fleet of patrol cars to electric vehicles. Chris Van Cleve goes for a ride to look at the challenges and to see how it could be beneficial. The NYPD is putting an electric future to the test rolling out the first of nearly 200 new electric patrol cars, the largest police EV trial in the country. You definitely get a lot of glances and, and people wanting to take pictures of the new cars. Yes, Officer so Ryan Delasio has been driving one of the new Ford Mustang Mach-E cruisers. Was there any skepticism about having an electric as a police car? I think the skepticism really was it being able to charge and having the time to charge it. Uh, but as of, as of right now, we haven't had any issue. Turning the black and white, or in the case of the NYPD, the blue and white green has been a 15-year journey. The agency started testing retrofitted civilian hybrids in 2009 and pushed forward to make a true hybrid police car. We were there in 2019 when they got their first hybrid SUVs. Each delivers about a 40% improvement on fuel economy, saving 700 gallons of gas a year per vehicle. Now the department is taking civilian EVs and modifying them for police work. The NYPD has always been at the forefront of new technology, and these vehicles are part of that. NYPD First Deputy Commissioner Edward Caban. This is the first time we have a fully electric vehicle that's to be used for patrol purposes, and we have to test that out. We have to see if it stands up to the rigors of patrol. We know our cops can. They do it day in and day out. We have to make sure these vehicles can. The Mach-E has more horsepower, more torque, more advanced safety features, a faster 0 to 60 time, and faster braking than any other vehicle in the NYPD fleet, something we experienced firsthand on the department's test track. Right, let's see how this goes. Including an obstacle course all recruits have to successfully navigate. 
gas. Stay close to the left, close to the left, close to the left. Slam on those brakes. Well, there went some cones. Ah, uh, listen, I won't tell if you don't, Chris. Don't worry about those cones. <laughs> While the NYPD's pilot program is by far the largest, police departments around the world are testing electrics, from Teslas on patrol in Luxembourg to a Maki -E keeping the peace in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, where the sheriff expects to save about $26,000 in fuel and maintenance. Still, Ford anticipates a gradual transition. It will be a slower progression to electric than it is for you know, a retail customer to adjust to, just because a vehicle is used for a police officer in a much different way. Fremont, California police found the change comes with a bit of a learning curve. Down to six miles of battery on the Tesla, so I may lose it here in a sec. In 2019, officers nearly ran out of juice during a pursuit because the department forgot to charge its Tesla. One of our big concerns is, are we going to be able to keep these cars out there on a continual basis? Inspector Scott Alexa is the NYPD's commander of fleet services. He's getting daily feedback from officers testing the cars. What are you seeing that you like about the electrics? Where maybe is there room for improvement? Overall, the car seems to be performing well. Our officers are spending you know, a full eight hours in these cars on most occasions, so we definitely want to see them in a more comfortable position and have more space in the car to put police equipment in the car. So far, Officer Delasio is liking what he's seeing. Do you feel like this is just as capable of a police car as a gas-powered car? I do, yeah. I think it drives just as good, if not better in some ways, than, than the uh, gas-powered cars. You're convinced that this has a future in policing? I, I am, yes. If it's managed properly and uh, gets... Plugged in at night? Plugged in at night, yes. <laughs> um, it can be used very effectively. A charged-up test drive through the Big Apple. Coming up, how cities are seeking billions of dollars in restitution from the opioid industry. This is Eye on America. Drug companies and pharmacies are facing lawsuits from U.S. cities seeking restitution for the staggering economic costs and loss of human life. Over 16,000 deaths in 2021 were the result of overdoses from prescription opioids. Jonathan Vigliotti takes us to San Francisco, one of the cities taking legal action. For more details. The streets where Sam Lawrence once lived may not look like an expensive San Francisco neighborhood, but there is a high price for living here. This is what drugs took me to, you know? This is, this is what I got. I chose this. You know, in a lot of ways, I didn't have the power of choice, but in some ways I did. Drug addiction in San Francisco streets and hidden in homes would need $8.1 billion to rectify, according to claims made in a federal court case. The city of San Francisco sued drug companies, marketers, and pharmacies, alleging they get people hooked with legal prescription opioid drugs in the first place. At the age of 18, started using prescription drugs, and it's just progressive, you know, starts out fun, occasional, you become dependent, and then you physically need the drugs in order to be, to do anything. Many also end up at the city's general hospital, which is why emergency room director Dr. Chris Caldwell testified in the federal case. It would be hard for me to describe a greater crisis in medicine than what we face with the opioid epidemic. What does that look like day to day for you? So I don't do a shift without seeing multiple different aspects of the opioid crisis. So we'll see the acute overdose where somebody has taken too much either intentionally or accidentally. We also see the devastating effects of long-term opioid use and what the patients will describe as such an intense need to get that high again. People sometimes develop an image of what they think of as an, a person with opioid use disorder and I promise you that it impacts every type of background or area of life that you can possibly imagine. Emergency care is just a part of the cost San Francisco City Attorney David Chu wants to recover, and his office reached a settlement with two opioid manufacturers, Allergen and Teva, in which they must pay $54 million to San Francisco over the next 15 years. I've heard of doctors being pursued for their role in prescribing these drugs. It, it's not so often you hear pharmacies being targeted. 
why go after pharmacies? And I imagine that there's some difficulty and challenges that you discovered along the way while pursuing Walgreens. Sure, well, we actually brought this lawsuit to go after the entire opioid industry. Uh, but specifically around, around Walgreens, I'll, I'll say that our lawsuit was a bellwether case uh, in part because it was the first bench trial, not only to find the opioid industry liable, but specifically to find the pharmacy Walgreens liable for what they did to our community among thousands of communities around the country. San Francisco's opioid lawsuit is just one of 3,300 brought by state and local governments across the country to make the opioid industry pay up. And already there have been $54 billion in settlements. Most of the money is designated to addiction treatment and prevention. The numbers are really uh, like small parking tickets. They're really not creating any incentive for change. University of Maryland professor Lisa Vertinsky studies the impact of large class action settlements. So the money is largely going to address the harms that have been caused as opposed to um, being invested kind of in more systemic efforts to prevent that kind of harm occurring again in the future. For Sam Lawrence, his days addicted to drugs and living on the streets have ended, but it was not because of legal settlements. He ultimately credits a support system of friends. So I, I spent some years working with my buddy Quinn in treatment, and now I've made a transition into doing uh, construction work. I spend time with my family and I go to the gym and I go to work and I make sure to participate in my self-help groups. I help others. Tiva, meanwhile, in a statement said its settlement is, quote, not an omission of liability or wrongdoing. We stay in San Francisco for a surprising look at wildfire prevention. Hundreds of goats are grazing across hills and fields to help minimize the risk of fires. John Blackstone introduces us to one helpful herd on the front line. For hungry goats, California's unusually wet winter has produced a bounty of green. But this herd is not grazing in the countryside. Instead, they're on an urban hillside in San Francisco, eating their way across concrete terraces and scrambling on cement slopes, all under the care of Genevieve Church. I'm the executive director of City Grazing. I'm the most glorified goat herd on the planet, yeah. In all, her herd numbers 128, and the city is their pasture. And we are a nonprofit, and we take goats all over San Francisco and uh, some of the surrounding Bay Area to eat down fire hazard, as we are here at Malcolm X Academy. The goat's main job is fire prevention, because all this green will turn brown and dangerous in California's dry summer. But here at an elementary school, Malcolm X Academy, the goats can also be educational. The students get to come out here and see this, and it's a really tangible example of what we do and why we do it. Rebecca Poland is landscape manager for the San Francisco Unified School District. The goats, she says, provide a lesson in sustainability. It's a really circular ecology. The goats eat the grass and, you know, they digest the grass and their waste is really great for the soil, which helps with erosion. Um, and so over the long term, instead of slowly degrading the land, we're regenerating the land. You must have maintenance staff that could come out here with tools and cut all this down in a few hours, probably. You know, some of the area is sloped, so that's a little tricky to do. And then, of course, once they cut it, all of the grass would be remaining here, and the goats will eat it, so it's actually more fire safe than it would be if we did it with the crews. What other kind of fire prevention could bring this much joy? Now, why would a goat eat some grass from a hand on the other side of the fence line when there's all this grass over here? It could be more delicious. <laughs> Who knows what that child might put through the fence? So they are always opportunistic little beasts. For special ed teacher Teresa Bryant, the goats are a gift to the students here. Now the kids don't get out in the neighborhood, so they really need to see the goats in the neighborhood. They enjoy something live, not in the country, but right here in our city, in our neighborhood. But it's a neighborhood and a school that sometimes has to struggle to find beauty. Sarah Aldama is school social worker at Malcolm X Academy. Um, our average student uh, comes from typically low, low income, with families of color, born and raised, multi-generational families within our community. Uh, what are the challenges? Various challenges within just attendance, showing up to school and, and having a consistent routine sometimes is hard. Do you think attendance will be pretty good this week while the goats are in the yard? <laughs> it's exciting there. Definitely excited to be here with the goats.
It is likely to take the 25 goats on this job a week or so to finish the cleanup. How much can a goat eat in a day? As much as it wants. <laughs> it's a perfect job for an animal that's known as a big eater, but contrary to popular belief, goats won't eat everything. They don't like lavender, they don't like sage, they don't like rosemary, uh, they don't like eucalyptus. They won't eat burritos, you were telling me. They don't like burritos. People like to try to feed them their leftover food. Sometimes we do ask, please don't feed the goats. With plenty of what they do like here and surrounded by admirers, this just may be a goat's field of dreams. Ahead, Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian talks about his big push to fight climate change. That story is next. We close our show with a look at bright minds on a mission for a greener future. Reddit co-founder Alexis Ohanian is investing in our planet by funding climate solutions from talented young people. Ben Tracy hears from him and some of the young entrepreneurs he's backing. We live in a big, diverse, and beautiful world, and that makes me even more passionate to save it. Maya it's Penn gave her first TED Talk when she was just 11. She started her own sustainable fashion line at age eight, and earlier this year was featured in Vogue for her climate activism alongside singer Billie Eilish. So your resume is basically three pages long at the age of 22. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> now let me find the things I was just telling you about. And now at 23, she's finishing work on an animated short film about bees and the loss of their habitat. It's an environmental action adventure, and I really want to normalize topics like sustainability, normalize topics like climate and environment. Viola Davis is an executive producer, and Whoopi Goldberg is voicing one of the characters. It was extremely, extremely surreal hearing words I wrote come out of her mouth. <laughs> That's got to feel good. Alexis Ohanian selected Penn as one of the first recipients of his $100,000 grants for climate and environmental entrepreneurs. What does it mean to you to have somebody say, I believe in what you're doing and here's $100,000 to do it? It means the world, being a woman, being a black woman, being so young. Did you feel like you were often dismissed by people because of those things? I feel like I've definitely been like dismissed or gatekept out of a lot of spaces um, because of those factors. The most inspiring folks are the individuals who are doing the work. They are just compelling as hell. Ohanian was also an overachiever, co-founding the social media network Reddit when he was 22. He says if he had a do-over, he would have done something else. Yeah, Climate Tech is the kind of company I would start today. The greatest existential threat we have is the threat to climate. In many ways, if we don't solve that problem, nothing else is going to matter in 100 years. This was an experiment that started out as a kind of crazy idea maybe a year ago. These are the first grant recipients of Ohanian 776 Foundation, which intends to give out $20 million to fund climate solutions. We just want to see the best ideas get funding. Even if you haven't totally figured out and it's just in its research project stage, great, here's $100,000. This has to be one of the best parts of having a lot of money. It's true, it's true. 20 young people from all corners of the world are using his first round of funding to attempt everything from removing planet warming carbon emissions from the air to decreasing the spread of wildfires. One is building fully robotic micro labs for biotech research and development, while another is reusing waste created by recycling aluminum. We are closing the loop on aluminum recycling. Rostam Reifscheider was just 20 when he started his California based company, Hydrova. It turns the waste byproduct of aluminum recycling called dross. So, this is dross right here, some nice chunks of it, into a raw material for making cement. That could help keep one million tons of dross out of landfills every year. That's cement. Exactly. Using it to make cement lowers the carbon footprint of an industry, which accounts for nearly 8% of all planet warming emissions. What makes a 20-year-old interested in the waste byproduct of aluminum? I grew up in California, and I've witnessed the effects of climate change firsthand. I always knew that I wanted to dedicate my career towards climate change and bettering the environment. 
Hydrova has proven their technology works, but Ohanian says he knows that many of the efforts he funds will fail. I tell these fellows, I just need one of y'all to do something amazing, and I will be bragging about that for the rest of my years to my daughter. Right? <laughs> be like, hey, remember, Papa was the first that. one to believe in that thing that saved our planet. He's talking about his five-year-old daughter, Olympia, who he shares with his wife and tennis star, Serena Williams. I want people to come up to Olympia talking about how cool her dad is just as much as people come up to her and say how cool her mom is. And, <laughs> it's a high bar you know, in your family. I know, look, I don't think I'm going to win, but I'm going to put up a hell of a fight. And it may just also be a win for the planet. At the end of the day, we're just trying to solve one problem, which is keep this earth habitable for a very long time. And that's what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. Climate fellows, thank you for taking a bet on us. All right, cheers. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America. This episode of Eye on America is sponsored by Prudential. Plan. Invest. Insure. Retire with Prudential.